Good evening and welcome to a um, regular meeting of the Oak Harbor City Council. This is a workshop uh, regular meeting. Uh, our agenda starts at uh, 5 o'clock. Uh, March, and today is March 25th, 2020. Uh, obviously, uh, during this time, uh, this is a, a trying time for most municipalities. Uh, and I, my hats off to our uh, very capable staff for um, setting up this second uh, tele uh, meeting, and uh, uh, especially off to city council. Uh, and, a, and a special thanks to Joel Servadius, who uh, who worked very hard to uh, help this process and this uh, meeting agenda. Thank you to all of you for, for uh, uh, much hard work. Uh, obviously, it's a trying time for cities with the uh, coronavirus uh, and uh, new orders from our, our governor to stay home and stay safe. Uh, I, you can rest assured that uh, uh, the staff at the city of Oak Harbor has <coughs> taken this task on um, and, and my hat is off to them. I um, continue to praise uh, their hard work during this time because not only do they um, do they have their regular work to uh, to try to complete, but um, it, it's a it's a process that's much more difficult to deliver good services from behind closed doors, um, and uh, and I I believe the city of Oak Harbor is is uh, doing that in a, in a great fashion. So thank you uh, to those of you that are watching us. Uh, we are definitely providing our services. Uh, you have the same safe city. Uh, uh, we just need to get through this uh, COVID-19 um, problems and and then um, get our economy started back. So uh, this evening's meeting, I believe we, we have uh, two councillors who are absent. We have heard from uh, Councillor Tara Heisen and, and Councillor Bill Larson that uh, for, for reasons uh, beyond their control, they could not uh, participate with us tonight, but we, we do have uh, the rest of council and, and Mayor Pro Tem. So I know that you're out there. I see your pictures. I, I uh, again thank you for for uh, uh, doing this from afar. Or, uh, um, one of our, I thought for a while that Mr. Servadius was actually out at Deception Pass. He, he had he had a picture of the bridge behind him, but I see now he's back in his office. So um, again, thank you. Uh, this evening, uh, we have we have one action item at the beginning of our meeting here, and then uh, we have about three or four presentations thereafter. So um, our action item is um, a resolution 20-12, uh, uh, authorizing the mayor to sign the Rural County Economic Development Grant application. And this evening, I think uh, we have our city administrator, uh, Blaine Oborn, to present that. Blaine? All right. Um, just starting off here, Island County is accepting grant applications for the Rural County Economic Development Funds. Uh, this is an annual grant process, so we've been doing it a number of years. Um, city staff has reviewed the possible list of projects uh, we believe that are ready to be submitted this year. And the project that we feel that is ready is the Marina Boatyard Acquisition Project. This is a uh, grant a resubmittal of our previous year's uh, grant, and this one's ready to go. We've not quite in the, the shape we hope to be, but we've been able to learn additional information, uh, and we've been able to kind of adjust this, what I'll talk about a little later. Um, city staff uh, anticipates there will be multiple projects uh, that might be eligible for next year uh, for this grant, and that would be the wet fiber installation, Windjammer Park Amphitheater, uh, Goldie Road, lift station and additional marina improvements so unfortunately none of these other grants were available for this year's submittal um, the uh, gr funding applications are supposed to be due by the end of this month march 31st 2020 and that's why we're uh, putting it working into the agenda now uh, they, don't, they don't give us a lot of time to turn around and, and the do the grant so um, the total grant is for seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars with 600 and, and with the city uh, 
the total project is 750, and then the city's uh, seeking grant funding for $675,000, and then the uh, matching of 75,000 and matching will be combination of in kind and other funds, and we're still working on the uh, split there. Um, the exact combination is still being developed at this time. So uh, last year when we did this grant, we included it combination with the uh, line item that we had in the state budget, but after doing some uh, analysis there, it has to be fully funded, and so um, we couldn't meet that requirement, so we're looking at other projects to use that 400000 from the state and not including it in this grant tonight. So with that, uh, I recommend that the council go ahead and approve the resolution 20-12, and I think we have to do public hearing on this, our public comments on this, Mayor. Uh, yes. I guess before we do that, I should have, I should have made sure that um, I let you know that we do have uh, uh, five of our counselors, Mayor Pro Tem, and then uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Munns. We have Councilor Servadius, uh, Councilor Wiesner, Councilor Wassinger, and Councilor Mack all attending here. So uh, before I ask them for questions and, and or uh, their input. Uh, I'd let you know that, that our packet requested that if the public did have any questions or input, uh, they could do that in two ways. Uh, uh, they could communicate uh, directly with us here at City Hall by, uh, and or, or a survey monkey, I believe, is the, uh, 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 the other way. And so, uh, and to my knowledge, we have none from our public, okay? Uh, no questions, so we will uh, then go to council for any input or questions uh, regarding this. And uh, I guess what I will look for is a raised hand. If, you, if you've got anything or want to make a motion, you raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Lisa is standing ready to do that. <laughs> so looking for input, questions, motions. There, there's a, looks like we've got Wiesner. Councilor Wiesner. Oh, Joel. Joel okay. Too. Okay. Um, I was just testing the system. No, I'm happy to make a motion, but Jim, go ahead if you've got something. <laughs> Jim uh, Wiesner, move. Yeah, he's oh, got to unmute. Okay, there we go. There, thank you, Joel. I just have a question. That, you know, that, what have we changed about the grant application from last year? Is this pretty much the exact same? Grant application we submitted last year? No, the uh, dollar amount is different, and we did it in a combination, assuming that we can combine it with the appropriation for the marina that we had. So we just are doing the whole grant uh, in, instead of dividing it between the uh, state funds and, and this funding source, we're, uh, we're seeking only this funding source. So it's a larger amount. Um, that we're looking for, but we think it's more clear to do it that way. And then, like I said, uh, we unfortunately, after doing a lot of, uh, and Steve Powers are here to verify that, a, a lot of analysis on that funding, we just couldn't uh, divide it. And it just, the uh, it goes in stages and it just would not meet the uh, funding requirements. Thanks for that, Blaine. Thanks for that, Blaine. I think that the county had an issue last year, if I remember right, with the, the grant application based upon the number of jobs we thought we were going to create through that? Is that has that been relooked at? Yeah, what we did is it's not quite as exciting as last year because we, we took out the second component. We're doing this all on boat storage. Um, certainly we're talking about it and, and have it in there that we'll certainly look at, at uh, repairs in the future. But right now we're just focusing on, on uh, city staff and boat storage. And Steve, uh, if you want to add anything to it, you're welcome to do so. Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman Wiesner, uh, Blaine's right. Uh, what we've done is simplified this year's application to have it just be representing the acquisition of the business for boat storage. Uh, the county did express some concern last year about us moving into the repair and maintenance and they required us to submit a uh, <clears throat> business plan uh, in order to support that grant application. And that's part of the difficulty that Blaine alluded to that we had with accessing the funds from the Department of Commerce. We intended to use those funds 
to pay for that business plan, but given the uh, restrictions on accessing them, we weren't able to do that. So we've scaled the application back just to acquire the business so that we can add to our revenue through the dry boat storage, and we'll revisit those other portions in future years. Yes, Mayor, Council Member uh, Munns. Oh, yes, uh, Councilor Munns. I'll make Mayor. the motion if uh, everyone is ready for it. Okay, sounds like uh, Councilor Max got a question. All right. Councilor Mack? Where is he? He's there, but he's not off yet. Okay. Yeah, I think you have to unmute yourself, Council Member Mack. Can you un unmute yourself, uh, Councilor Mack? We're not no. hearing you yet. No, we can't hear you. Is there a button? How about now? There we is. go. There you go. There You're go. on. <laughs> okay. Um, real simple question was, um, what's the estimated timeline for all this grant process. I'm not real familiar with it. For this project? Right. Um, it has a lot of attainables there, so I, I think within a, it's an acquisition, um, so assuming we can acquire it, uh, I, I think hopefully within a year. Uh, Steve, you have any more to add on that? Or, See development of services directly. All right, yes, I was waiting to be unmuted. Um, Blaine's correct. We, uh, in terms of acquiring the business, I think we'd hope to have it done by year's end, um, but it's dependent upon how quickly the county administers their grant process. Uh, history shows us that that can be relatively quick or it can actually take some time. Um, and I don't believe that their uh, application announcement indicated a schedule for when they would be taking up the applications. Um, so another way to think about it, Mr. Mack, is we're about two months ahead of where we were last year in this process. And I think we got an answer from them, uh, feels like it was July or maybe August of last year. So, you know, hopefully um, they take it up in, in April and maybe we get an answer in May or early June. Yeah, so just to add to that, I, I did have discussion today at the uh, Council of Governments and so they're like us, they're in the mode where they're just focusing on COVID-19. So they may delay that uh, timetable process uh, for approval, so. Anyone else, any other questions? Okay, now we'll go back to Mayor Pro Tem. Right. I move to approve resolution 20-12, authorizing the mayor to act as the authorized representative on behalf of the city of Oak Harbor and to legally bind the city of Oak Harbor with respect to the Marina Boatyard Acquisition Project for which we seek funding from the Rural County Economic Development Infrastructure Investment Program of Island County. We've got a motion. What's that? Second. And, and Joel. Suggestion, can we turn off the unmute all and trust everyone can do it themselves? Then we can chime in and make a motion or a second. And then the hosts can obviously mute people if they need to. I will second the motion. Okay, we've got a motion and a second um, to uh, approve this resolution 2012 exactly like it reads in your packet. Um, seeing no other questions or input, all in favor say aye. And the yes, are, are we using the yes button or are we giving you a verbal affirmation? Mac, can, well, I, make yes. a, can I make a suggestion? Yes. Joel. Mayor, if you would just ask everyone to, we've tested this as a council, to press the yes button or press the no button. Okay. Dan Carla can see exactly who voted. Okay, then that? let's ask everybody to press the yes button at this time. 
to vote in favor. Can you open chats where do we see that? Are you on that, Lisa? Any, are there any nays? Okay, we have five yeses, so that would be no negatives or no nays, so that passes unanimously. And now, uh, as, as Joel suggested, can we just un undo the, okay, so everybody is, is unmuted at this point, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll move forward. At this time, we'll go on to then our non-action items, um, and the first one uh, under uh, is, un is public works, Island County Comprehensive Solid Waste and Moderate Risk Waste Management Plan. And I think that uh, I noticed that that is going to be presented tonight. Uh, is it Kathy or, or uh, our public works director is with us. We have our city engineer, Jim Bridges, and I, I see that we have our project manager, Brett Arvidson. So Kathy, can I lean um, to you? Yes, Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, members of the council. We also have Steve Beebe here. Uh, he just doesn't have the video. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Hopefully this works. So let me get started. Um, now I'm not getting to. Oh, hold on. Okay. okay. Am I sharing my screen with everyone? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so what we have before you tonight, we, we went through this several months ago. There's been some updates to the county uh, solid waste and moderate risk waste management plan. Um, so what this plan is intended to do is to provide guidance for solid waste system for the solid waste system in Island County. It includes garbage collection and disposal programs for waste reduction, recycling, organics, compliance and enforcement proper management of moderate risk waste, which used to be called um, household hazardous waste, and um, the public education and administration of those programs. Why is that not working? Okay, so um, this is a six-year agreement between the city of Oak Harbor, city of Langley, Town of Coopville and Island County for the management of solid waste in accordance with RCW 70.95.080. And it designates the county to handle the city's moderate risk and hard to handle waste. This RCW 70.95.080 requires each county in cooperation with the various cities in that county to prepare a coordinated comprehensive solid waste management plan. And cities have three different options. The first is to prepare our own comprehensive solid waste management plan um, with the county um, for integration with the county, or we can enter into an agreement with the county in which the city will participate in preparing a joint plan, or we can authorize the county to prepare a plan for the city's solid waste management for inclusion in the county's plan. And we have um, uh, operated under an agreement with Island County and we participate in the preparation of a joint city county plan. So that's um, number two, bullet number two. Uh, there's, there's several things that this plan has to consider. It includes source separation of recyclables, organics, and um, uh, waste generators waste by the different generators, collection of source separation of materials, handling and proper preparation of materials for reuse or recycling, um, prep, uh, handling and prep preparation of organic materials for composting and, or anaerobic digestion, and handling and proper disposal of non-recyclable waste. Uh, it also requires that we look at methods um, to address fault, uh, several different um, materials, including construction and demolition waste, organic material, including yard debris, food waste, and uh, food contaminated paper products, um, recoverable paper products, metals, glass, plastics, 
and waste reduction strategies. So um, this is going to require a solid waste interlocal agreement between the City of Oak Harbor, City of Langley, Town of Coopville, and Island County. It's for a six-year term. Steve Beebe, our staff member, participates on the Island County Solid Waste Advisory Committee. Um, this agreement, as I mentioned before, includes uh, our moderate, waste, moderate risk and hard to handle waste, household hazardous waste, uh, and the county contracts for the long haul and landfilling of our solid waste over in Eastern Washington. Um, city residents uh, may use the, the facilities at Island County Transfer Station, the one down in Coopville or the one on Oak Harbor Road. Um, they can take their recyclables uh, if they don't want to use our program or if there's too much to use our program, uh, construction and demolition debris, yard waste, there is a septage facility at the facility, uh, county facility down in Coopville, and we do still have some properties in the city that are on septics. The moderate risk, risk waste, that is the household hazardous waste, as well as um, they can take solid waste to uh, either the transfer station on Oak Harbor Road or in Coopville, Coopville for disposal. Hold on, I've got Cortina now on my screen. I don't need her. Not interested. Yeah, sorry. Oh my goodness, she's not going away. Anyway, um, I don't know how to make her go away. Let's go to the next screen. I'm stuck. Anyway, um, I'm just gonna go to the next slide that I can't bring up on the screen, I apologize. The next step is April 7th at your next council meeting. We will be bringing a recommendation to approve the agreement and authorize the mayor to sign the agreement with Island County. Um, and uh, I'm, I stand for any questions. And I got out of Cortina. Wow. Okay, so is that, that's it, yeah. right, okay. Okay, so um, we've got a, a, a large packet of information. Uh, so how about uh, any questions from council? Say what? Okay, can you-, you want me to stop sharing? Yeah, yes. yeah. There we go, great. all right. Okay, so we're back to, uh, um, uh, this is a time for council questions or input. Anybody got any questions or input? Okay, seeing none. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff Mack. Councilor Mack. Okay, I'm here, sorry. I'm getting used to my apparatus here. Um, question for Kathy here. Um, are we gonna approach, or are we approaching anything for commercial recycling, uh, or is that, nothing that's gonna happen with where we're at. In other words, like the commercial district, cardboard, that type of thing. Um, I'm gonna let Steve take this, but I do believe we have some commercial recycling accounts. Um, we've, in the past, we haven't um, made it, uh, we, we've let businesses choose who they wanna recycle with. Steve, do you have anything to add? Hello? Yeah, you're yep, on. Yeah, hear. you're on, Steve. We can hear your voice. Okay. Um, the biggest, we offer the 95 gallon carts for recycling at this time. If we were to offer dumpsters, that would require us to get a whole different type of truck because um, you got to keep that material separate than the others. And currently, there are two other companies, uh, Tri County and Skagit uh, Steel, that offer the cardboard recycling and it's much more effective from the city's point of view not to get into that business at this time. So nobody is um, doing the small blue dumpster in the commercial districts? No, that's not, no, we, we offer, if, if you get in touch with um, 
either Skagit Steel or Tri-County Recycling, they will give you a dumpster to put cardboard in. Okay, well let me uh, clarify, not a dumpster, but our City of Oak Harbor blue container, uh, I don't see those in the commercial district and I've been approached on for a smaller business if we are doing any of that recycling or if you have to take it to actual the county site that type of thing? No. Um, each one of our customers who have a dumpster are able to um, ask for a 65 gallon carton that is incorporated in their bill. Okay, great. I will take that uh, accordingly. Thank you very much, sir. Yep. Any other uh, questions or input? Thank you very much for that uh, information. We will now move on to our next item. Um, Mayor? Uh, yes. I'm, I'm going to request that we uh, table the next item to the next available time slot. I feel it's a very important item of discussion. I know that staff has worked very hard on gathering up a lot of information that I really appreciate uh, that we just received this morning. I, I know there's a presentation that there's a this is not an action item however i feel in order to focus the appropriate uh, amount of energy i need into this presentation in this serious matter with what's going on right now around us i don't know that i personally feel as though i'm totally capable of that at this point um it, it, again it's it's a, a very serious matter that i i think deserves 100 percent of all of our attention and and uh I think we'd be remorse in, in thinking that any of us don't have some of our attention being uh, sent elsewhere uh, with what's going on in the area. So um, I, I respectfully request that we consider moving this item to the next available uh, meeting. Could be workshop. So um, next workshop, yes. The next workshop would be scheduled for April. Yes. Uh, that would be. Uh, April 22nd. So I do know that we've got uh, Mr. Korn scheduled to, uh, in fact, he's with us here. Um, and I'd be anxious to hear from other counselors. I, I did, uh, um, you know, I, I know that any discussion is difficult this time with what we're dealing with. Uh, and, and especially want to reach out to staff and say that, again, I know that you've put a multitude of your time uh, and and then and then had to deal with all this other stuff so it, I'm just anxious to hear about other counselors do you want to go ahead and and discuss some some of this at this time or how do you feel I'll I'll okay. step in can everyone hear me counselor uh, Watsinger yes oh thank you um, I feel like I am not prepared to um, uh, give my input or discussion. I just, you know, just receiving um, the email this morning. Uh, so I would not be able to add a lot as a council member discussion wise and questions wise yet. I haven't had time to process um, the email from this morning. Um, and also I did have a question though, um, if we were to postpone this, um, what were, um, Patricia, what were you thinking timeline for the necessity of this? Um, because I, what's also important to me um, is that we have, when we do go to have this in a council meeting and take action, I don't think this is the appropriate venue to do that. Um, I think that that needs to be done to allow public to have their input, especially a matter like this. Um, so what are you thinking for for what were you thinking and maybe what what are you thinking now in these circumstances for a timeline for this action? So this wouldn't be an action meeting. This is just informational answering yes. the questions that were brought up. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole goal of this was so that we could present you with the information. You'd have time to hopefully consider it. Um, also ask extra questions while we have Sean and his model available. The longer we postpone this, um, then 
we may want to just look at the 21 option for rates because once you get to half year, it's going to change the rates that we have recommended. Um, they were supposed to start beginning of, of 2020. Sean, do you want to comment on any of this too? Sure, I would just echo uh, the discussion on as, as we develop some of the scenarios that the council requested uh, from the last meetings, then as this is pushed out, then that could have and does in some of the utilities some greater impacts on overall levels of rates. Uh, as we lose the timing, you know, six months or a year, then those expenses don't necessarily go away, but the revenue isn't there to match with that. I see other hands up. Mayor, are you going to direct those questions? Yes. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. We can't hear you. I'm on music. There we go. No. Now we can. Okay. Um, we're paying for uh, Sean's time anyway, and it seems to me you never can get too much information whether you can digest everything that was sent today or not. One of my questions is, uh, do we know how many homes, residentials, are hooked up now, what the, that number is that he's basing his um, data on? Sean, I don't know that answer. Do you? Uh, we have the rough number of accounts that, okay. that we use to base the analysis on. And what, what number was that, please? Just, just roughly. I won't hold it to you. <laughs> uh, just a sec. I will pull that up and look at it. I wasn't prepared for that question. Um, it does vary by utility, though. So okay. just one moment. So it's essentially four different of order. numbers. Mayor, point yep. of order. Yes. I think it would be important. I think Mr. Wiesner was working towards a motion. I think even though these are uncommon times, we shouldn't lose all sense of a meeting and parliamentary procedure. If we're moving forward, and Mr. Wiesner makes a motion and gets a second, then we can discuss whether or not we want to continue, but we're kind of having that discussion right now. Did you want to, uh, did you want to make a motion? Yes, Mayor, I would like to make a motion that we table this discussion so we all have times to put the appropriate effort into it. I'd rather make the right decision than the wrong decision. And I move that we table it until the next workshop meeting. Do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. I, even though it's not an action item, we will, we will handle this like we would uh, uh, any other motion. Let's, let's uh, uh, ask for more discussion at this point then. Uh, and, and I don't know whether uh, Sean or you are prepared to answer uh, Mayor Pro Tem's question about the number of uh, accounts. Yes, Mayor, I can if you'd like. I can uh, answer those. Okay, did, <phone rings> Councilor Munn, or uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I assume that uh, you would like to hear that answer. We can't hear you. But I just believe in the more information you get, the better you can process everything, whether we're going to make a decision in April, May, or June, okay. if we just have a conversation and glean as much information as we can each time we have a meeting. And if we're already paying for Mr. Corns to be present with us, we may as well get our money's worth. Okay. Uh, we have uh, some other uh, councillors who had their hands up. I think Councillor Cervadius. Did I? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I realize it's 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 uncommon times and people are there's a lot of trepidation going around. But I would 
I agree with Ms. Munns. If we're all here, let's have a discussion. It doesn't mean we don't repeat the discussion. We've done that before, had discussions, repeated the, the item during a council meeting, and even then moved it again. This is something we've been working on for a little while. We're all here. And I truly think it's a good test of the, uh, pardon the pun, but the emergency broadcast system to see how well we can conduct a meeting. We may be doing meetings like this for the next 60 days. That's all. Okay, anyone else? Is there any other? Yes, Councilor Mack? Uh, yes, um, I agree with all the council members. This is too important of an issue, not only with facing the council members and the staff, but for the residents of Oak Harbor, and I'm with it, let's just slow down, take our time, we'll get it done, but even if it takes uh, uh, 30 to 60, up to 90 days, I understand the financial consequences, but I feel that we can uh, uh, get something done in the next 30 to 60 days. So I'm with uh, everyone else there and uh, sort of postpone or cancel this issue. Thank you. So we've, we've actually got a motion to, to table this until the next available meeting, I think was the yeah, next workshop, next workshop, which would be in April. And so that, that was actually the motion in, in second. And so I believe we, uh, can I ask a quick question, mayor, Sean, are you available at the next council meeting? Good question. <laughs> well, what date would that be? Uh, April 22nd. And just for correlation, we canceled the 21st regular council meeting, so we will probably have some action items on that agenda also. Okay, it is April 22nd. I, I will need to double check it on my side. I have a tentative similar meeting like this on the at 3 p.m. on the 22nd. Councilor Servadius, did you have? Thank you. I would just once again reiterate, we're not taking action. The gang's all here except for Tara and Bill as far as voting members. I'm not so confident that the next time we get together, it won't be in the same type of venue. So why don't we want to go through the information once now? The public will have a chance to view this on YouTube. They will then have a better perspective of what we're talking about and then we revisited our next meeting. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. The motion is to postpone this until next available meeting, which will be the 22nd. And I'll ask for all in favor of that motion at this time, say aye or raise. We're using the voting. Press yes. First, yes. I'm yes. sorry? Yes or no, they would press. So do we have five votes yet? It's not all on the screen at one time. Our clerk is tabulating now. <laughs> so we don't, we only have We need Erica three votes? To, er, four votes. Erica needs a, our council member Wassinger. Needs to vote. Okay. You got five there. Okay. okay. So we have we have three no's. No's. And two yeses. And two yeses. So we will. That means that we will go ahead with our um, with our planned discussion of utility analysis at this time. So I'll go back to Patricia. Is it? Yep. Okay. Okay, so um, we're going to present this in a uh, two parts. So I'm going to start with um, listing all of the questions from council members that we received. And then um, there'll be multiple people responding to those staff members. And then when we're done, Sean will do his presentation. And then if you have any specific questions at that time, he can do, he has his model with him, so he can put those in. So I'm going to share my screen.
All right, so I have the screen shared. All right, so um, overview of the presentation, staff and Sean, um, we're going to be responding to the council's written questions. Sean will do the three alternatives plus um, have his model available for any other questions that you have. And then at the end, any discussion question or questions. Mayor Pro Tem Beth Munns asked, what if the sewer rate is based on how many toilets you have in your home? Sean Korn responded um, with this um, information. But Sean, if you would like to um, weigh in on this, Any further? I won't read it to you guys because you all have it. Sure. My my only comment on this would be that uh, at the current time, what, as we went through the study, we maintained the current rate structure. You can, or there are other alternative rate structures that could be reviewed at part of the, as part of this. Uh, that would bring it back to the drawing board in some sense to determine what those billing units would be. And it can be a fixture unit. It can be, uh, you know, different equivalent units that we could use to calculate this. Uh, but ultimately we'd have to come back to the council through staff uh, with those alternatives and what that would look like to the different customers, depending on how that worked. But that is a possibility. You would also want to consider the administrative impacts of having to count fixture units or equivalent, you calculate equivalent units, but that is an al a feasible alternative. So before we move to the next slide, if any council members would like to ask additional questions on this, please put your hand up and I'll, I'll um, take those questions. Seeing none, I'm gonna move to the next slide. So this um, came from council member Erica Wassinger. Question, can we look at the rate changes, for example, $2 for three years or $4 or $5 for each one of the three years to see what it would look, what it would do to the reserve balance, operating surplus or deficit, or the overall bill change? Sean addressed this. Um, he'll address this in his model. Um, but if he doesn't answer specific questions at that time, we'll go ahead and um, take more questions at that point. Any council member questions at this point on that? Okay, seeing none. Council member Joel Servadius, he had a question of what is the cost of waiting graphically? Utility rate versus years out of not increasing at an amount recommended based on O&M capital and debt. Sean again will um, discuss this in his presentation. Any questions? Seeing none. Council member Bill Larson had five questions. Um, I am gonna take them each in different pages, but um, they're all included in this first page. Second page is the council member uh, question one. Um, so, hold on. He'd like to see the rate study data presented out three to five years. Um, Sean's presentation does that. What is the impact of lowering the reserves? He would consider as low as 15%. In our first option, we discussed ut which utilities could be lowered, and Sean will go into detail on this during his presentation. The third question is, although we can't identify specific projects to cut or postpone at this time, if we pull a couple of amounts from that list, how would, the impact, how would that impact rates in the model? And we actually have, um, I sent you all the capital improvement changes that we did for storm drain, and we have done for um, water. Sean will go into that in his presentation in more detail. Um, number four, what is the impact of lowering the deductible on the insurance? And I'm going to turn that answer over to Blaine. All right, I'm ready on that one. On the insurance savings by uh, going to a higher deductible, we can't change that until November. Uh, there's a number of complications uh, because we have to do it for the whole city and so other uh, funds would be impacted by that. I don't recommend factoring the savings in at this time, uh, but certainly that's something we can look at when the uh, rates come out in October and November, and I can bring uh, options to the council for consideration at that time. Thank you, Blaine. Does anybody have any questions on that before I move on? 
seeing no hands, we'll go to the next one. Um, Council Member Bill Larson's um, fifth question was, since the rates are covering operating, operating budgets of the departments they support, is it possible to look at what effect on rates would be if we were able to cut 5% of operating across costs across the board? I'm gonna turn that answer over to Kathy, Brett, and Jim, and I'll let them respond as they need to. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. I've been trying to unmute, so can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. So our operating budgets have been um, established based on actual costs from previous years, and if we have any foreseeable needs or if we know, for example, that some utility cost is going to go up um, or supplies, those kinds of things, that's how we establish our operating budgets. The clean water facility was uh, that budget because we had never um, operated an MBR plant before. It was based on estimates from similar type facilities. And we now have one full year of operating experience. Our estimates were fairly, fairly accurate. However, we're still generating operating experience and gaining efficiencies. So we're hoping to, through 2020, get a better idea of what those operating costs are gonna be. I would also like to mention that our staffing levels are at a, a minimum and our supervisors actually work with the crews in the field. Um, reducing the budget by 5% would really require us getting into our staffing levels because um, our budgets are very tight um, and, and there just isn't any other room besides staff to, to cut out 5%. And um, there's a couple of things in this, in this slide. I wanted to show you that our staffing levels over the years, 10 or more years, have actually decreased or remained fairly consistent in all of the utilities. So back in 1999, we didn't have the, uh, or we were just starting the automated system um, we had eight full-time employees today in 2020. We have 7.33 full-time employees and the city has grown um, a tremendous amount in the past 21 years. Um, in the water division back in 2009, we had 8.33 FTEs. We are currently at six. Again, the city has grown. We have implemented some efficiencies such as the radio read meters that have allowed us to reduce those staffs, but we really are at a minimum staffing level. In solid waste and, or uh, storm drain and what we call wastewater collections, um, we are right where we were 11 years ago. And then uh, for the wastewater treatment plant or the clean water facility back in 2000, we were operating both the lagoons and the RBC plant. We had eight FTEs. Um, we currently have 8.33 FTEs, and that 0.33 it represents Steve Beebe. He spends about a, a third of his time in, um, in wastewater. I do need to note that the staffing plan for the clean water facility was required by DOE as part of our permit. Uh, they approved that staffing plan because they want to make sure that we have appropriate staffing levels to operate the plant as well as perform the necessary ongoing um, maintenance on the facility. They don't want us to let the, fa the facility fall into disrepair, which would then um, possibly lead to um, a violation of our permit. So that's what I have. I don't know if Brett or Jim want to add anything. This is Brett, nothing. Likewise. I think Kathy uh, said it very well. So do we have any questions from council? If so, please raise your hand. Um, Joel, I'm unmuting you. Thank you. Um, so a pretty interesting slide. I'm just curious, do you know either Steve or Kathy, we're looking at either 10 or 20 year um, segments here for all of these departments. What the change in population has been, that's a pretty interesting slide to see that those FTEs have stayed completely consistent when the size of the city, I'm guessing, has probably grown by 30%. I'm curious what that number might be. 
Um, we typically grow about a thousand uh, people per year. Um, so I don't have the number off the top of my head going back to 2000, uh, but it, it's been pretty consistent at about a thousand persons per year. All right, thank you. Okay, so I don't see any other hands up. We'll continue on with the presentation. Councilmember Jim Wiesner asked, what do other communities in our, our area consider ample reserves within their enterprise funds? I would like to know if 25% is considered the norm, including in solid waste where it seems like that fund would be less volatile than the other funds and may allow for a reduction in reserves while still providing a cushion for that fund. Sean um, is uh, answered that um, it's more about what the industry standard is versus what other communities are doing. And he does, there are two um, utilities that we did look at reducing and costed that out that he will present in his presentation. Is there any questions before I move on? Okay. The council I've been holding my hand up because nobody's seeing me. I, you have to do the hand. I can't see you oh. unless you put your hand on the thing. So um, got go it, ahead. Got it. There, like that. Go ahead. <laughs> um, just uh, one question, Patricia. I had asked for some information on uh, operation and maintenance and I don't know that that's come through yet and going back to uh, some of Kathy's comments involving reductions it sounds as though we feel as though the only area in which we have the ability to do reductions is in personnel when isn't operation and maintenance a, a pretty good hunk of the budget for each of the utilities also I'll answer the first question. I included the uh, utility financials, five years worth of numbers in the email that I sent this morning. So it might've been one of the documents you haven't had a chance to open up. So it's there for all four. And then I'll let Kathy respond to your other question. Ms. Rosen. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, our operating budgets really don't have a lot of fat in them. They include all of the necessary utilities, which um, we really need to pay to keep our operations running, um, supplies and materials. Uh, there are um, any taxes that we have to pay, such as the city utility tax. There's um, some other, uh, uh, transfers out for um, services provided by other departments such as uh, finance, legal, the utility office staff. There really is, um, oh, and all of our uh, equipment uh, repair maintenance and um, replacement funds. Really, that's all that it goes into those operating budgets. So uh, we, we have to have our supplies, we have to have our utility, pay our utility bills, we gotta pay our taxes and indirect cost allocations. Um, so there's really not room to cut 5% out of those. We still need to be able to operate and um, stay in compliance with our permits. So any further follow-up questions or can we move on to the next slide? Yeah, I've got one, one, more, one more just comment. Thanks for that, Ms. Rosen. Um, I don't want to put words in the Councilman Larson's uh, mouth, but it, I think his question was pretty clear. I don't think we're looking at cutting 5% uh, uh, from, from operation and maintenance. I don't think we're looking at cutting 5% for personnel. I think he was looking at an overall 5% uh, uh, cost reduction, which uh, obviously could be a combination out of each department, one out of more or you know, one out of operation maintenance or, or more out of uh, uh, personnel. So I, I, I guess what I just want to, to leave this with is, it sounds to me like what we're saying is we, we are operating 100% bare bones right now, looking at uh, reduction in, in any cost involving uh, utilities is really not the direction we need to be going. We need to be going the direction of just determining how much we want to fund and how many, uh, uh, capital improvement projects we want to fund because that's really the only area that we have uh, to look at in order to uh, not take on the full rate increase as suggested. That the, of the three things that drive rates, you've got operating and maintenance, reserves, debt service, and capital improvements, or four than capital improvements. 
So capital improvements is one of the large ones in some of them, in some it's not. And then like in the wastewater fund, that's debt service. That's our large driver of those costs. So those are the only two areas it sounds like we can even look at in debt service, obviously, is the debt service. So it, it leaves capital improvements is it? That's what Sean's presentation will show you, our three options. And that's um, he can go through that in more detail. And if you have more questions, we're happy to answer those. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. You're welcome. Anybody else? Okay. Um, Council member Jeff Mack has six questions and we'll go through those on multiple slides. So the first two, currently the minimum percentage for the city's reserve is 25%. How many times has the reserve been reduced below the 25% mark and what were the circumstances for the reduction? Sean Korn answered here, the goal is not to go below the 25%, it's a minimum target level. Ideally it is never to go below that level and per fiscal code, we have to plan if the policy says that we're gonna keep it at 25, that's what we have to plan to do. The second question is, what capital improvement projects are needed most concerning the wastewater treatment facility? And the study is very, uh, per Sean, very limited capital improvement projects included in the wastewater rate study. The key driver is the annual debt service. So is there any questions on this before I go to the next slide? I don't see any hands. The next question by council member um, Jeff Mack is, what is the minimum and maximum projected growth rate for the next 36 months? So Sean can explain this um, probably better than, uh, in verbally better than he did here. And then Steve will then um, answer your question. So Sean, do you wanna go? Sure, thank you, Patricia. So one of the, th the items we wanna consider as we establish rates is what we know at the current time. And so as we build these, we wanna make sure that we are a bit conservative on growth. We don't wanna under project, or sorry, over project our revenue and under project our rate adjustments. Generally what we try and do as we establish our rates is be conservative on that growth assumption. It's really a much more longer term discussion as those new connections come online. Then that allows you all to look at what the current revenues are, what the projected rates are and make adjustments. The first couple of years, as you'll see when I get into my presentation are very fairly critical on how we establish rates in the future and making sure that we're not over projecting that in the short term is important. Okay, um, thanks Patricia. So um, a great question, Councilmember Mack. It's, it's tough to tell you what a rate is in terms of growth projections. Um, what we can tell you with a high degree of certainty are the number of units that we, and I'm assuming we're looking at residential here, that we have in the, in the pipeline or in progress. And that's what this slide is intended to do uh, for the council. So uh, as you can see uh, across the top of the chart there, table, project name, project type, uh, the number of units that are proposed, uh, what stage in the process they are right now. And then the real, and those four columns are easy to give you the answers on. The real wild card, of course, is when are those units gonna become available uh, and when might they become customers of the various utilities? Um, <clears throat> and so I won't go through each of these uh, line by line. Uh, you can see that uh, as of a couple of days ago, we have 557 units, uh, what I consider to be in progress. Uh, they are in various stages within that uh, process. Uh, some of them are under construction uh, some of them are midway through various approvals and the, the very bottom one, the one that's called the Third Avenue Townhomes uh, is just in a pre-application stage. Uh, the when available then becomes, again, as I said before, the wild card. Uh, the ones that are under construction, we can make some guesses as to when we think they might be done and be ready. Uh, I did reach out to a couple of the developers uh, to get uh, some idea of when they think they'll be bringing their units online and that's where we see the starting fourth quarter of 2020 numbers uh, for the hillside projects and for the Marin Woods. Uh, a couple others were easy to guess, but there are some that just have question marks uh, and it's because 
there's no way for me uh, to know when they're going to be ready because they're not yet at a stage that's close to breaking ground. Uh, so to sort of sum it up, I can tell you how many units are in the pipeline. Uh, I can give you some uh, estimated guesses about when things might be ready. Uh, and of course, the huge wild card uh, is the current situation that we find ourselves in in our country. Uh, and I don't think anybody knows right now what this is going to mean to housing starts uh, should the pandemic continue uh, to stretch on and on for months. I hope that's somewhat helpful. So does anybody have questions that they would like to ask at this time? Please put your hand up. Joel, go ahead. Just a thought, if you could, it takes us on the iPads a second to get the hand up, but just maybe slow it down a touch. Could we back up two slides, please? Yes. I don't know. One of the questions I'll have, I think, and we'll probably get to it. I think Council Member Wiesner was working towards it. And Mr. Mack, on his second question here, I don't know if he was asking specifically capital improvements or the waste, what might affect the clean water facility or those just in general capital improvements, such as stormwater. Um, I mean, I think this is a big area we're going to spend time diving into, so I'll just wait to see what Sean presents. But um, I wanted to make a point on that, and then if you would just give us a few extra seconds to raise our hands. Thank you. No problem. Sorry about that. So I'm waiting here. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay. I'm going to move on. Council Member uh, Jeff Mack, uh, question four. Do any of the other departments have surplus funds that can be transferred to a capital improvement fund? Um, the short answer and long answer is we can't transfer money between funds. Governmental accounting requires fund-based accounting. Each fund must balance within that fund. Each utility must operate as a separate entity, business-like. The revenues generated must cover the cost incurred by that service delivered in the fund. The exception is general fund, but as most council members that have been here for a while know, general fund is one of our hardest assets to um, budget because there's more um, requests to utilize that funds than there are funds available typically during the budget. So that's that answer. Blaine, the uh, question number five, what is the current status of the negotiations with the Navy in regards to the wastewater treatment facility partnership and how many options are on the table? I'll let you take that one, Blaine. Uh, we just uh, give you an update. I just uh, spoke with uh, representatives from the Navy and we have uh, five meetings scheduled every week in April. So we'll continue to discuss. It'll be a lot of uh, discussion meetings and hopefully we'll get into uh, negotiations as part of that. But uh, I think, uh, we need to figure out where their proposal is and they want to continue to vet our initial proposal there. So uh, all I can say is uh, they're really committed to negotiating with us and we're really committed to negotiating with them. So it's a, a good opportunity that we have with uh, weekly meetings for April coming up. And so we'll just continue to do that. But as far as the outcome, um, it's hard to predict. I think uh, on the plus side, I think that they feel very committed to coming to negotiation and we do too. And the other fact, even if we do come with a negotiation and settle on a rate, uh, the implementation period uh, may take some time and that's where uh, Ms. Uh, Rosen or, or our city engineer could can kind of talk about the time frame. But even if we do, it could be a year to three years or four years before we actually uh, do the connection and go through all those procedures. So with that, uh, I guess uh, I'll open it up to Ms. Rosen if she wants to talk about the implementation a little bit. Um, if we reach agreement, we will need to design the conveyance system and get that constructed and that's at a minimum um, with permitting environmental a minimum probably 18 months to two and a half years or so before that conveyance system could be um, in place and functional i don't know if jim or brett have any other input on that
Yeah, I, I don't have any more to add to that. I, I think that time frame is uh, probably optimistic. Yeah, this is Brett. Yeah, the bigger issue is the majority of the collections and transmission system is actually on Navy property. So our side of the collection system is more doable quickly, but they have a whole bunch to build. And I think that's going to be the major slowdown on it is getting the stuff to the city limits. I guess on our side, it's actually relatively simple. So again, it's kind of back in their court, you know, our side to pull around, like Kathy said, is probably a good 18 months, but the on the treatment plant side, it's we can take it pretty quickly because we do have some excess capacity to accommodate them on a short term. And our, our improvements are mostly along Bayshore. But like I say, the driver is on their property. Okay, so does any council members have any more specific questions regarding this? Seeing none, I'm gonna move on to the next, the, my final slide. Um, the sixth uh, question of six from council member Jeff Mack. With the projected growth in the next 36 months, in addition to dropping the city's reserve between 18 to 20 percent during that 36 month time frame, can we hold the wastewater treatment rate increases to 50 percent of the proposed rate increases and still maintain the ability to do the highest priority capital improvement projects needed for the facility? And I'm going to turn this over to Sean, and then he will be discussing this more in his presentation. Thank you. Yeah, the, the real driver on the wastewater side is actually maintaining the debt service coverage ratios. So as we move through this next year, those debt service payments reach their essentially their maximum debt service amounts, and then that carries out into the future. And so really that's a big component, or most if not all of the component of the change that's necessary on the wastewater side. On the capital side, we're only running about five to 600,000 a year in capital improvements uh, out over the next five year period. All of the capital or the vast majority of the capital is included in the prior years, some in this year uh, to finish things up, but that's all included in those uh, bond and debt revenue uh, expenses that are hitting the books here over the next year, a year and a half as part of that. And so that's really the driver on the wastewater side. Thank you, Sean. So before we let Sean start his presentation, does anybody have any further um, questions on this? Um, I'll wait to see. Council Member Mack. Um, yes, thank you so much for uh, going through and answering all those questions. Um, uh, it's gonna be interesting uh, how we move forward. Thank you again. You're welcome. So now I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to, oh, Jim Weiser, sorry. Go ahead, Jim. Sorry. Hey, thank you, Patricia. We'll get used to this. <laughs> Appreciate you guys' patience. Um, Sean, you, you mentioned the, 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 the debt service being probably the, the biggest incremental thing that we're dealing with in this rate study. And we had done a rate study prior to going in. Um, in fact, we had, I think we had a rate study given to us in March of 2019, if I'm not mistaken. And at that point in time, I think we had a pretty good idea of the overall cost of construction of the sewage treatment plant. Is, is there something that's changed in that, that debt servicing that's facilitated a, a little bit of a tweak to, to the rates versus the, the rates we were supplied back in March of 2019? I think there's been a couple, a couple of things uh, that have gone on since that study. The overall debt service level is pretty close to what we had projected uh, back during that last rate study. Uh, as we talked about at the last workshop, uh, we do have some higher O&M costs when we talked about the insurance, some of the electricity costs uh, here in the short term as things are getting worked out and you're starting to run the plant uh, as part of that and, and moving forward with it. That actually has an impact on that debt service coverage ratio as well because that coverage calculation is based on total revenues less O&M divided by the maximum debt service uh, in a given year. And so that's really what's 
the combination of all those pieces coming together is what's driving the need to make sure we maintain our, our coverage ratios, as well as the policies on the reserves uh, and, and meeting all those needs combined together. Thanks, thanks for that, Sean. So, you know, we're seeing a, a increase in the rates versus that study from 2019, which is fairly significant percentage-wise, but not all of that percentage is, is due to those O&M items, right? Correct. It's a combination of, of all those pieces. Okay. Thank you for that, Sean. Okay, um, are there any other questions before we turn it over to Sean? All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing, Sean, and I'll let you take over. All right, well, good evening. So as we've talked about, as part of those questions that were submitted to staff, as well as some of the information you provided them at the last meeting, we've put together some alternative rate studies or analyses for each of the utilities. And so what I wanted to do, I'll hit real quickly, just a reminder on the purpose of the rate study and the process, and then we'll get into those alternative study uh, analyses that we've put together. So the key of the rate study as we go through this is really to make sure that we have sustainable long-term revenues for each of the utilities. And that is on a standalone basis for each utility given that they are those enterprise funds. So we need to make sure that we're adequately funding our O&M as well as our renewal and replacement uh, or capital needs as part of that. Uh, a key part of this as we've always talked about is our Financial policies, some of those are legally, re legally required, such as the debt service coverage ratios. Others are city policies based on minimum reserve levels, as an example. So as we go through this, we want to make sure that we're able to meet all of the council and city's policies as we develop the analysis. As, as we went through this, we developed the updated the revenue requirement or the financial analysis component of this. And what that really means is we compare the revenues to the expenses. And it takes a look at, okay, what level of revenue or rate adjustment is necessary to meet that? Taking into consideration all those operating and capital costs, we look out over a multi-year period. This focused on a five-year, but we actually have the models out to a full 10-year period. So we are looking long-term on each of the utilities. And we wanna make sure that the utilities as an enterprise fund are on a standalone basis and that the revenues from the services meet the expenses of providing those services. As we moved into rate design, then what we have done as part of that, as I mentioned earlier, is we maintained the current rate structure. So we did not propose any alternative structures as part of this study, uh, but as some of the questions alluded to, there are alternative structures that the council could consider as you move forward in the future with each of the, primarily the water and sewer utilities. So getting into the alternatives, I'll give a brief outline of each of the options. There were three options for each. And then what my plan was is to walk through each utility individually. And then at the end of the slideshow, or as we get through all the alternatives, then I have a summary of what that combined utility bill is. So incorporating all four utilities and each of the scenarios for those. So. As I went through this, uh, based on working with staff and the information that was provided from the prior meetings, for water, the three options, the first option includes a revised capital plan. The second option includes the option one revised capital plan, as well as removing the interpretive center contribution. So that was funding from the water utility to fund a portion of the interpretive center at the plant. Option three, is the same as option one, except we push out the rate adjustment. So there's no rate adjustment in 2020. We leave everything else the same as option one and we look at what those rate needs uh, are in the out years. On storm drain, we have a revised capital plan as well. We have also reduced the reserve targets down from 25% to 20%. 
We've option two is option one plus the removal of the interpretive center contribution. And then option three is the same as option one, but no revenue adjustment or rate adjustment in 2020. Solid waste, very similar to the storm drain options. Uh, option one, no change in CIP. Really, there is no capital plan in the solid waste uh, utility fund. And that is because all cans and carts and all of those expenses are included in the ONM budget. Uh, option one also included a reduction in the reserve target from 25% to 20%. Option two includes those same changes plus the removal of the interpretive center contribution. And then option three has no change in rates for 2020, but the same reduced reserve level. On wastewater, there was no change in the CIP. Again, I mentioned earlier that we have fairly minimal capital needs planned out for the wastewater utility over the next several years. We Option two, removed the interpretive center and funding contribution. So we took out the funding contribution from each of the other utilities and then we also removed the capital project from the wastewater plan. And then option three is no changes in rates for 2020. So as I go through each of the utility scenarios, then what I will do is kind of outline some of those key changes that we made. I've got some dollars and years on how items have shifted. Based on some of the discussions we've had in the past and some of the questions, I wanted to do a, a brief summary on reserve targets, what they are, what their purpose is, uh, and how you've established those. There are various industry information and approaches that are out there. The American Water Works Association had just recently put out a reserve paper, a uh, white paper on reserves that is available as part of that. Uh, Government Finance Officers Association has standards uh, that are used out there as well as the Water Environment Federation. So we have the water agencies, the accounting side of it, and then the wastewater agencies approach to those. All of them are really come back to be based on a percent or days of O&M or percent or days of revenue. And that's really the goal of what those look at. And the purpose really of these, there's a couple different types of funds, but ultimately the purpose is to provide stability during low revenues revenues for emergency or pre-funding of future capital improvement projects, as well as minimize the risk and meet the future funding needs of each of the utilities. And so that's really what we're trying to do as part of this. And as we look at that, you can have many different types of capital reserves. I usually break them into two components. One is unrestricted and one is restricted. Unrestricted essentially means that they're available for use for that utility. So water funds stay in the water, but they're available to meet multiple needs. So some folks will have a specific operating fund for the cash flow needs, the pay the bills needs. They will have a capital fund to fund future capital or plan for major improvements. And they may have an emergency or a rate stabilization fund as part of that. And that's there in case it's uh, on the water side a really wet summer, so revenues don't come in. Uh, so they may have those types of funds. On the restricted side, these funds can only be used for specific purposes. So a good examples of those are debt service reserves. So those funds cannot be used for anything else. They're generally required as part of the funding operations. And then those are used to pay debt in that final year with those funds. System development charges are another good example. Those funds have to be used for a specific purpose. So they may be set aside in a, in a separate fund to fund those projects. So when we start looking at this, uh, there's a couple key targets out there. Uh, one of the ones, if you look at the GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, which is referenced in both the American Water Works and the Water Environment Federation documents, they talk about an operating reserve minimum of 30 days of O&M. Now, that's generally combined with some other funds. So that is just the operating. That's the cash flow component that is recommended to make sure that those funds are on hand. So as we looked at this, the city doesn't currently have a separate capital or emergency fund. So really that 
reserve fund is there to provide several different options. So it's there to provide that cash flow, to balance the capital needs, as well as be used in any emergency situation. Whether that's weather induced, customer induced, uh, the situation we're in today, uh, those are funds are available for that. So as we went through this and something we talked about during the last uh, meeting I, I participated in is when we looked at stormwater and solid waste, there's generally very little revenue variability in those enterprise funds. And so we felt it was appropriate to drop that down to 20% of revenues so that we could, could read, see what impact that would have on rates and revenues over the long term as part of that. For water and wastewater, uh, I felt it's very appropriate to keep it at the current target level. For water, the reason for that is, is you do have upcoming future capital improvement projects. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. Uh, but it's also a consumption-based revenue, which can really drive the overall need for reserves should there be a really wet summer where you don't sell as much water because people don't need to use as much water. Similarly, on the wastewater side, given the level of debt, then I think it is appropriate to have that 25% of uh, revenue reserve target just in case there is a year where you do have issues and you do have to draw from reserves to pay for annual debt service payments. So now I'll move into the different alternatives. I'll start with the water rate study alternatives. So everything we're doing here, I have, when we go through each of these alternatives, I have four included. The first one is really the base case. That's what we discussed uh, last time I was there meeting with you all uh, based on the rate study results. So option one for water included a revised capital plan. And one of the key changes here as part of this is we removed the Crosstown Transmission Main project. That was out in 22, 23, 24 timeframe. That is a project that was approximately $4 million. So that is completely out of the analysis right now uh, based on this option. We also shifted the West 384 zone improvements from 2021 to 2023. It was spread over a three year period design and then your construction timeframe to 2024 to 2026. So that shifted approximately 3 million out over a three year period as part of that. As we looked out over the long term, so again, I talked about we're focused on five years, but we did develop a 10 year plan. Then we reduced that out year annual rate funding capital level from 2 million down to about $1 million based on the future capital needs. And so that does have a long term impact as well that was uh, included in the base case. Option two, remove the interpretive center. That was $225,000. And then option three, again, it's alternative one, but we had no rate change for 2020. So what does this start to look like? Here's the overall revenue adjustments based of rate adjustments based on each of the scenarios. So the dark lines are the base case. And so you can see we had our 4% and then our two, four and a half 2 4 percent in 22 and 23, and then that dropped down to 2%. So based on moving out the West zone improvements, the West 384 zone improvements, and eliminating the Crosstown project, then you can see under all three alternatives, there is no rate or revenue adjustment in 2020 or 2021 for options one, two, and three. In 2022, option one and three do have a revenue adjustment. Uh, option two does not. So that removal of the $225,000 for the interpretive center actually gives us sufficient reserves to carry ourselves for another year. And then you can see everything in 23 and 24 for the options is down at 2% a year. Now, as we go through this, we want to make sure that we're meeting our reserve levels. And so you can see the red horizontal or slightly increasing line because that's based on revenues uh, is slightly increasing over time. Excuse me. 
for each of the options, you also notice that we are above that minimum target. And the reason for that is, is we are not just looking out through 2024, we are looking out farther. And so remember I said we shifted the West 384 zone project in 2024, 2025, and 2026. That was about $3 million. That Those funds above that red line in 2024 for each of the alternatives, which is just over $2 million for each of those, that is essentially being used in those next two years to pay for that project. So that's why it is higher in this current year. And again, if you remember for op those options, just to flip back, then that includes a 2% revenue or rate adjustment in 2022, three and four for the options with the uh, exception of option two in 2022. So this really does take a long-term look at that and trying to balance this over the long term with some fairly minimal adjustments in the out years based on moving that capital out. So what does that look like to the average customer bill? Then you can see here the base case, again, the left-hand bar, the darker bar, and then each of the alternatives. And then we've got the data table underneath. So if you jump to 2024, then you can see that the base case in that time frame had the water, average residential water bill at $57.47. And you can see about seven to eight dollars savings in each of those options by having just those 2% adjustments or the total bill going up just over $3 uh, on average for each of those options over this five year period. Any questions on water before I go into the next utility? Okay, seeing none. On the storm drain, here's the details of the three options we put together. Again, we have the base case, which was the rate study I presented last time. Uh, for the revised capital plan, we shifted out $550,000 from 2021, 22 to 23 to 26. We've reduced the minimum reserve target from 25% to 20%. And we also reduced the annual rate funded capital levels to reflect the funding needs and reserve levels for the stormwater utility. So this is a bit of a circular logic as we start funding capital because it's a balance of using rate re annual rate revenues ex and existing reserves. So as we shifted that capital plan, reduced the minimum target level for reserves, then we we're also able to meet the funding needs of the capital plan by reducing the annual rate levels that fund capital. And so we kind of got an extra adjustment here on the storm drain side to help us out with lowering the overall revenue needs of the utility. Option two, remove the interpretive center. That was also at 225,000 for the storm drain utility. And then option one, we had, uh, or sorry, option three, we had option one revisions to the capital reserves and rate funded capital levels, <coughs> excuse me, and no adjustment in 2020. So what is this scenario? <laughs> Pardon me. So what does this scenario look like? Again, the dark bars, we had previously 4% in the last rate study projection that we had. Under option one, that reduces down to 2% annually over the entire five year period. Options two and option three, we have no change in 2020 and then it stays at 2% in 21. And you can see this is where option three, where we defer for a year, then we do bump up about half a percent a year on storm drain and option three to catch up to where we need to be out in the out years. Uh, so not a significant change as part of that, but that gives us, keeps us at those same levels that we need to be to meet policies. Same situation on the storm drain on the reserve side. Then again, we have our target minimum with the red horizontal line and then the reserve balances for each of the alternatives as well as the rate study assumption. This is similar to water in the sense that we have shifted some capital projects out over the 
next five years. And so those funds that are above that line, about 250 to 300,000 in most cases is used to fund projects in 2025 and 2026 as we move forward as part of that. The average residential bill here, again, you can see how that changes. Uh, the current bill being 1422 for the typical single family home. When you go out through 2024, the rate study was at $16 and 64 cents. Uh, this drops it a dollar or a little bit more than a dollar per month over that five year period based on those adjustments. Solid waste, again, very similar uh, scenarios. Sean? Sean, yes. um, it looks like Joel has his hand up. Oh, sorry, I'm not seeing that. I apologize. No problem. I'm just putting the putting the screws to the moderators. Hey, um, on the storm, actually backing up, probably in slide ten, but you don't have to go back. You said stormwater and solid waste were very stable, and yet when I consider what just happened with the inflow and infiltration, and maybe this is a question for Kathy. What capital improvements could you remind me again? Are we shifting to the right? Are any of those projects possible solutions to the infiltration and inflow problem that we had? I mean, I want to do the best we can for our citizens, but when I look at a dollar rate change, is that dollar to the citizen going to possibly prevent our treatment plant from having another issue? So the issue was not um, the capacity of the storm drainage. It was um, groundwater that was getting into old sewer pipes, um, mostly from the side sewers, but we do have some inflow and infiltration into our uh, mainline sewers as well. So um, in the project, we do have some um, uh, slip lining of the of sewer lines, not storm drain. And then the other is um, we, we think that with, um, and Brett's gonna have to help me out here, but with some additional membrane capacity at the wastewater treatment plant, we could handle that additional inflow and in infiltration. So it would be more of a wastewater project or projects than storm drain. Got it, thank you. For solid waste, very similar scenarios as we talked about. Uh, there is no capital on the solid waste side. That's in, that's funded separately. It's all included in the O&M component. So on this one, again, the reserve target will be, would be reduced from 20% from 25% down to 20%. Option two, remove the interpretive center contribution. That was 75,000 for the solid waste utility. And then alternative three is the reduced reserve target, but no rate change in 2020. Now, as you look at this, we have the same four scenarios. Uh, the rate study that we previously presented was running at about seven and a half percent and then dropped down to about 3%. Uh, so an option one where we've reduced the reserve target drops down to about 6%. Uh, over the next three years, uh, sorry, four years, and then drops down to about 3% in 2024. Alternative two, where we remove the interpretive center funding, that's very similar, almost identical to uh, option one as it plays out over the time frame. But option three, you can see, given the deferral of a revenue or rate adjustment in 2020, then we have about two years of 12%, and then that drops down to about two and a half, three percent in 23 and 24. So that's the impact of deferring that first year. And if you remember when we talked last time, we've got the impacts of uh, changes in the tipping fee as well as the recycling cost increase, which is really what's driving the solid waste discussion in the rate study. And then if we defer, we essentially use reserves a little bit quicker and we've got to get those back up to our minimum target. So as you look at the reserves for solid waste, you can see option three as an example, 
drops down to our minimum levels in 2021, and then we keep it right at those minimum levels. And that's with those two years of 12% in 2021 and 2022. Uh, all of the options in this case, given the, the chain, no capital needs as part of this, you can see run right about at that minimum target level. Again, uh, just as a point of reference, under the rate study, those bars, the red line would be equal to the darker bar, the left-hand bar in each year, under the 25% target. So we were running right at that same target. We've just reduced that target now. So that's allowed us to reduce the overall rates and needs over the next five-year period. The average bill you can see here, uh, current bill is 1990. And then as that increases over time, you can see it stays relatively the same. Uh, as we get out into 2024, we end up at about $26, 26 dollars, 26 and a half, 26 and a quarter dollars per month uh, under each of the scenarios. So not a significant change by lowering the reserve target down to 20%, but it does give some uh, relief over the time frame. Uh, the big change here, as you can see, we have, and we'll show this in a later slide, kind of how that changes. Um, you know, we have a bigger change in the overall bill for that when we defer that. So wastewater, we had no changes to capital. So it's essentially the rate study projection for capital. Uh, option two, we removed the interpretive center. So that was the contributions from everybody as well as the project itself, which is $925,000. And then option three, we have alternative one, which is no change, but then we have no change in rates in 2020. So as you can see here, uh, everything trends fairly closely to the rate study. That's because we have no capital changes. We're only funding about five hundred to $600,000 a year in capital improvements over this time frame. So with no changes there, options one and two look very similar to the rate study. Uh, option three, you can see if we defer a revenue or rate adjustment in 2020, then we would need about a 22% increase in 21. And then we come back down uh, a little bit lower. So this is the impact of compounding rates. As we look at the six and a half percent in the rate study or seven percent in the rate study if we don't do those then we lose that compounding we have a significant increase in 2021 and then you can see in 22 through 24 much smaller rate adjustments or revenue adjustments because we've got that rate level up to a much higher level much faster with the deferral in 2020. reserve levels all are running right about the target minimum uh, and that hasn't changed much. We didn't change that target. And so really what that option three does is we reduce reserves down to that minimum right away and then we maintain that over the time frame. The average bill, again, not a significant change. You do see a couple dollar change. So currently $102.76, jumping out to 2024. You can see how that goes down about two and a half dollars almost uh, under option two and option three. So removing the interpretive center in option two uh, or having a larger increase in that second year, no increase in 2020. Uh, but again, you see a large jump in 2021 where that bill changes about $23 in one year versus a little bit of a smoother transition under all of the other options. So as we looked at this, a couple of concluding thoughts as we went through this, there are possible reductions in the rate projections. It does require extending or eliminating important capital improvements. We talked about some of those projects that have changed, uh, as well as reducing the reserve targets for solid waste and storm drain. Uh, the challenge on wastewater is the alternatives are limited, uh, you know, given we need to fund annual debt service, meet coverage requirements. We're maintaining, you know, five to 600,000 a year for pipeline work. Uh, that's really all that's focused on. And so what I wanted to do is give you an idea of what that combined bill looks like. <clears throat> so here it is for each of the individual utilities. 
the dollar change in each year for the rate study as well as each of the different alternatives. And then on the bottom, you can see the total monthly increase. And so that's maybe the better one to focus on. That's just summing the total for each year for each of the utilities. So you can see in 2020 for the rate case or the rate study, it was an $11.68 increase. Option one is a $9.28. Option two is $8.48. Again, no change in rates under option three. So no change, but then if you look at option three in 2021, that would be a total bill increase of $25.28 versus 12 or nine under the different scenarios. And then you can see the total bill change for the five month in the green on the right hand side of that bottom chart uh, to see the total change. So option one is about an $8. So that's revising the capital plan and the reserves that reduces that overall increase by $8. Option two, the removal of the interpretive center has uh, about an $11 savings. And then option three, we end up with about a $10 savings on that. So you can see those different impacts uh, from a monthly bill perspective. Here's the total bill. In total, you can see how that changes from around 100 and uh, currently $184 up to 230 under the rate study or 222, $23 under each of those options as part of that. And then also the percentage. So this is the total change in the percentage change in the bill. Under the rate study, we had a total bill change in 2020 of 6.3%. Option one, 5%, option two, 4.6, and option three, obviously zero, because that would defer any rate adjustments in 2020. And then you can see how that plays out over time for each of those options. So uh, as an example, option one, we're looking at about 5% on average here for three years, and then two and a half and 2%, 2.4 and 2.2% in those outer years as part of that. And with that, I'll take that. That's all I have for you this evening. So with that, I'll take any questions or discussion you all may have for me. I need to stop sharing or should I keep it on? Um, Joel's the first one that wants to talk. Uh, thank you. So couple of questions. Um, you know, obviously these are unprecedented times and I want to be sensitive whatever decision we end up making down the road uh, to make this as palatable for the citizens as possible. I do have the concern, you know, I've been here seven, eight years and every year we do a budget and we work through these things. Um, we just continue to, to cut and that's not a bad thing. That's, that's a good thing. But there gets a point where I feel like on some of these issues, we've kicked the proverbial uh, crumbling infrastructure can down the road so far um, that I just worry if we don't make these investments, it's not getting any better. On slide 24, Sean, you talked about, I think it was slide 24, uh, losing the compounding effect in the wastewater. Right here, that big jump in 2021. And this is something because of what I do for a living that I'm always paying attention to compound interest and what that means over time and losing uh, the effect of that, that compounding of that revenue. And so you can take a year off or two years off, but you lose that uh, compounding nature of that revenue. And then it's just exponentially that more difficult uh, to get it back. So. Of what I've seen so far, I appreciate and I can support reducing probably the stormwater and solid waste reserves. That seems to help. Um, two questions, and I'll let whoever wants to take them. Maybe one of them is Miss Rosen, or maybe they're both Miss Rosen. If we, it looks like we're using a fair amount of the interpretive center money to offset reserves and pay for some of this. Is that robbing? Peter to pay Paul, what happens? What are our thoughts on that? Do we not have an interpretive center? How would that change? So that's the first question. And then two, depending on how 
and when we make this decision, are we kind of possibly defaulting to option three anyway? If we wait too long, I think Patricia, someone stated earlier on that if we wait too long, we won't affect the change in 2020 anyway. So I'm wondering if we're kind of defaulting to option three already. So those are the two questions. I can start and then Kathy, go ahead and do yours. But Sean, I can defer to him after Kathy gets done on that second question. Joel, go ahead, Kathy. So the thought on the interpretive center is um, what is in the budget right now is to um, develop the plan and um, uh, get the displays. We have a half of an FTE that is authorized in the budget. From our time down at lot, we learned that we need two to three FTEs to have a really good, effective interpretive center. And given the um, current climate concerns about rates, um, we may not be able to get that the adequate staffing in the next couple of years in the next budget cycle. So um, I think our thought right now is to finish up the work with Enviro issues and Chuck Lennox, develop the plan and the ideas for the displays, but not actually purchase them, um, and then revisit it in a couple of years in hopes that um, the, the financial situation will look better. And we're not required because of grant <coughs> provisions or FRF, SRF funding or anything like that to have an interpretive center? So we're not required to have an interpretive center, but we are required in each of the utilities to do public education and outreach. It's different for each utility. For example, um, water, it's really focused on water conservation, solid waste, it's recycling, waste reduction, composting, those types of things, uh, reuse, um, uh, wastewater it's you know we wanted to have some education about the plant and the operation of the plant and how much cleaner the effluent is um, and then uh, um, also talk about fat soils and grease in the collection system that is uh, um, it's not necessarily a requirement but it is something that we want to educate the public on so that we don't have sewer uh, our, our collection system get clogged by fat soils and grease. And then of course we do have the public education and outreach that's part of our NPDES phase two stormwater permit. So each utility has to do that. We were hoping that we could have a really nice interpretive center and educate the public. Um, and um, that might just have to wait a few years. Thank you, Patricia, you've got question two. Yeah, Sean, did you wanna go down that road? Sure, uh, yeah, so that's a really good question. I think what you would lose if you did nothing this year is what's shown on these charts here. So that assumes no rate change. If you did implement something even mid-year of this year, then you would only lose that revenue that you would have collected let's just say it's six months of that revenue because those new rates would be collected at that higher level for that six month period you would gain some of that compounding back because that rate would then be adjusted again in 2021 so then you would be back up close to those levels of overall revenue needs that you would have so it wouldn't be as bad to implement partial year uh, the challenge would be you may be doing rate adjustments, you know, in a six month period, as an example, June, and then again in January. All right, thank you. So this is the time if you have questions for Sean on what he presented or if in our three options, we didn't cover things that you would like Sean to work up in his model um, that uh, you think might work. So Jeff has got his hand up. So thank you, uh, uh, Patricia and Sean. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but from what I'm understanding, 
uh, going to the wastewater uh, uh, facility, we're pretty much due to the debt service, we're pretty much stuck at a 7% increase. Sounds like there's not any wiggle room there to, you know, might escape this year, but it sounds like we're going to be right there at 7%. Am I saying that right? Sean, I'm going to defer to you. Yep. Sorry, I had to get off mute here. Uh, it's pretty close to that. We do get a little bit of, of savings. Sorry, it went too far now. I was going to go to the slide here. So we do get a little bit of savings under those different options, but given that we're not, there's no capital really to defer under the wastewater. Um, we weren't, I, I recommended we don't re reduce that reserve level as part of that. Um, then that does stay pretty close. You can see here on slide 26 uh, under options two and three, there is about a $2 savings on that overall bill, but that, that was all we came back with with the analyses we ran. Thank you, Sean. I understand. Is there any other council members that would like to ask questions or go to the next phase of presenting different um, things for Sean to look into? Erica, go ahead. You're still muted. I'll unmute you. Are you you oh, muted yourself? I got it. Thank okay. you. Uh -huh. Thank you. I just wanted to, and um, I'm not ready quite yet for questions. I'm going to have to digest this some more and then look at your email from this morning. Um, but I just wanted to thank you and um, Sean for presenting this today. And um, yeah, so that's it. Thank you. Beth, go ahead. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, we have commercial businesses that also have a hookup. Do, does that money also go towards the debt services for the clean water and the water and everything also or not? That doesn't make a difference. This is strictly residential. No, th this is everything. This is all wastewater revenue. So it includes all your single family, multifamily, all, all customers or accounts with wastewater pay for all components of the wastewater. And then Sean, I have one more question. Um, it looked like by the a sooner time, the, the reserves needed to be up, but it, could it be spread out over the five years or six years to become reserve neutral or does it because of our debt services it has to be done quicker so on the wastewater reserve specific specifically yes so under on slide 25 you can see where our reserve ending balances are in each of those years. And so for each of those scenarios, essentially what we've done under the alternatives uh, and in the rate study is we're, we're bringing those reserves down to that minimum target right away. So essentially from 2020 to 2021, we're running and then out for the most part, we're running right at that target reserve level. So unless that reserve target is different, we then that still doesn't have a significant impact on the wastewater side as part of that. And I'm not sure if I answered your question though. Um, I think I was looking at, so for only the wastewater, we, we must keep the reserves at 25%, but at the other ones, utilities, we can drop it down to 20. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah okay. for solid waste and for storm drain, given the the revenue stability of that rate structure and the service then i think those are feasible ones that we can look at to reduce that reserve target okay thank you very much sean and the rest of the staff for um, all your work i know you've just been hustling to make this deadline so thank you very very much 
Thank you, Council. Is there any other questions? Or um, if not, Sean can unshare his screen and we can go back to the agenda. No other questions then at this time under utility rate analysis. Seeing none, we will move on to our last item. Can, can we back up with that? Do we want to get some direction on when the yeah, council feel, wants okay. to bring this back? Uh, I guess the options I kind of look at, I mean, if you really want to move ahead, but it doesn't sound like there's a lot of emphasis to do that, we can bring this uh, a rate increase to the April 7th meeting. Um, we can also, if you want to digest to questions and come back for comments, we can uh, bring this back on the uh, workshop on April 22nd. We can bring it back as discussion only, or we can bring it back as a, an action item, or um, you're welcome to defer this for a longer period. So I guess we're looking for input, and Patricia, you can break in here, but I think I did a good job. If you have any more options of how they would move forward. I think I think you gave everyone possible. So, yep, whatever they want to do. Any um, input about how to move forward from council? Uh, um, Councilor Wassinger? Oh, yes. Um, so, uh, it was mentioned that even if we were to do a catch up, do a mid year um, for this year, um, Sean's still here. Yes, I see him. Um, it, that would still sort of flatten that 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 high jump that we saw. So, Patricia, what would we need um, to do? What what is when would we need to take action to sort of flatten that line a little bit? By I'm thinking, um, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm thinking mid year is kind of what Sean was thinking that that would be uh, the safest. If we go beyond that, then we might be impacting longer term. Okay. Agreed. So Okay, so for if we want to, like for me thinking, I'm thinking a mid-year, um, right now, that's just my initial thought on the presentation. So, um, you know, would, would uh, I'm thinking out, I, I really, like I said before, I'd really like to get this back um, for a public, you know, meeting. Gosh, it's just so much easier, um, public-wise, and not so much for us, this is great, but... Um, would May be too long if we tr tried for the a first meeting in May? I mean, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going on. I mean, if we have to do it in April, I'm okay with that um, too. I, you know, I think, I just don't I, know. I'm just I think afraid. May would be fine. And would you want it to be a workshop so you could ask, ask questions after oh. you've digested it? You know, I know I think we could take action in a May, if, if, if taking the action in the in a May meeting, like the first meeting in May, and even if we just have one meeting in May again, if it comes to that, I think we've just decided to do April for the summer schedule, right? Not May, just April. Yeah, I guess. Um, so even if we took action the first meeting of May, like to me, that sounds like a reasonable, that gives, um, it gives me a little bit more time to digest and look at your emails from this morning. And then if we have further questions, maybe just leave a little bit of time in, in a workshop, the April workshop for additional questions. That's what I'm kind of thinking off the top of my head. And but I, you know, love to hear what anybody else thinks. Thank you. So just to recap your proposal there, uh, we would mm -hmm. bring it back for further discussions in April, and then we would look at action on May 5th. How does that sound? Yes, then yes that, that sounds like something reasonable to me, if, you know, just, just digesting. But I'm open to other suggestions <laughs> or options. Beth, uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I was also thinking of May, but as we get closer to May 5th, if everything is the same as it is now with the COVID-19 or worse, then we may just have to wait till uh, December. But at least work towards this May, we can take an action in May, the first or second meeting, and put it into place by June and hopefully get uh, a good response from the public on how they're feeling. But I think we're all uneasy if so many people are out of work 
or too many people are ill on the island, which I pray doesn't happen, and we look, we're looking good, not the best, but um, I, I just think this gives us more time to digest it. And if we happen to have a question, Patricia, could we send it to you to forward it to Sean? Absolutely. All right. Okay, thank you. I just as soon push it to the May 1st or second meeting, depending on the situation that we are dealing with with our citizens for now. Okay, uh, and we have Councillor Mack. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor Severance. Um, I'm listening to uh, both uh, Council Member Washinger and uh, Mayor Pro Tem. I'm in agreement with that. I'm looking at May um, first or second council meeting, and uh, I agree with everything. We don't know what we're up against with a lot of different things, and uh, we can still pass some uh, questions and answers back and forth, and just more time. So, um, staff, appreciate you putting all this information together, but uh, let's just uh, uh, slide it down the, uh, the calendar here uh, another month or so. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Servadius. Thank you, Mayor. So, Sean, I'm looking at this last slide you had up. I think it's slide 28 of 33. I don't know if you can share your screen again so we can all see that. So, does option one include the reduction in reserves of stormwater and solid waste to 20 percent yes okay so for me you know also thank you staff sean for all of your work on this and i can support uh holding off on this so the public has a chance to hopefully digest this presentation I don't know if we would look at anything in April or not, but if we wanted to look at it in April and then have action in early May so that we can implement whatever changes uh, we decide on in June, I'm probably leaning towards an option one. It keeps, it's better than the base case. Obviously we slide some of those capital improvement projects out, but it, um, it definitely smooths out the curve as far as what I think the residents expect, um, or maybe option two, and we just remove the, the interpretive center funding and figure out how to do that at a later date. But those are probably the two that I'm looking at, uh, one or two. So once again, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Anyone else? Okay, then I think we've got a plan. Uh, yes. Okay. So yeah. we will uh, bring it back in April for further discussions at the workshop and then you guys can kind of reset the date and we'll kind of see the temperature and if you feel comfortable moving it forward on the May 5th or the latter one in May we'll we'll follow suit with that so May 19th is the date thank you okay thank you thank you uh, council for your patience and and uh, your time here We'll move on to our last item, uh, City Administrator Report. All right, I'm on. Um, just to try to go this, through this fairly quickly, um, my report, uh, Sabrina Combs, um, her be being on board as the new PIO really is helping out with the uh, COVID-19 education. And so certainly I hope you're seeing a uh, increase in information to being disseminated and our improvement in our communication to city staff and the council and then also to the community. So I appreciate her efforts and uh, great teamwork there. And certainly uh, uh, she couldn't do that with all the support of other staff in the city and kind of feeding information to her. So a really good team effort there. Um, on economic development, the uh, broadband backbone, unfortunately due to the uh, COVID-19, we had to postpone the educational meeting that we had. Um, and then we're working on a survey. There was some discussion on that. Once the survey's out, I will forward that out to uh, people that were uh, slated to attend that uh, 
that uh, engagement meeting and then get their input and then they'll follow up with a study there. Um, Anacortis, uh, we're getting close to uh, completing the uh, professional service agreement uh, for the water line issue and then there is some construction on the area that uh, we're doing the Path Lake to the Sharps Corner, um, or no, the Path Lake to Deception Pass um, Bridge. Um, that's already uh, been discussed in a previous agreement that we did uh, and in a work order from the city. So that's moving forward. Um, certainly uh, COVID-19 is, is a major thing, uh, effect on, on our way we provide services uh, with city offices closures and in uh, city working to implement the uh, governor's stay home, stay health, healthy order. Um, just provided an update to council members and to uh, city employees this afternoon. So information continues to go out on that and just uh, really can't appreciate the uh, and thank the staff for working together in a team effort and really adapting and, and uh, implementing the, the uh, processes as we try to uh, prevent that outbreak from continuing to affect our community and affect the uh, state and the uh, nation and the uh, world. So really uh, a big effort there. So on public works, um, certainly had the retirement, uh, Rich Tie House, uh, I think there was some confusion there in, in meetings that I have, but so we certainly uh, haven't made a decision on how we do that. We continue to uh, re vet uh, re reorganization options and then look forward for a potential retirement in the uh, parks uh, department and look at options there too with the possibility of creating a park and recreation department, which a lot of cities have. So. Um, and then certainly on clean water, uh, the Navy issue, I've already kind of talked about that with the meetings in April. And I'll go ahead and open it up to any questions. Any questions, Council, on that? A lot to read there. You can go through it and call in. Uh, yeah. If you don't, yeah. You're welcome Make to sure contact me call. as well. So. Okay, seeing none, uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn at this time. I move to adjourn. Oh, oh do, I'm sorry. Do we have one? Councillor Mack, did you have a question? Uh, no questions on that particular item. I would just like to interject a comment here. Uh, and this has to do with our first responders, both uh, Chief uh, Dressler and uh, Fire Chief Ray Merrill. Um, I take my hats off to you guys, uh, you and your people. Um, these are trying times, and uh, keep up the good work. Hang in there, and you guys all be safe. And thank you very much for your service to our community. Thank you. Thank Council. you. And we do have a motion to adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second. second. We've got a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. <laughs> aye. Aye. We're adjourned. <laughs> thank you very much. All right. Thank you. We did it. <laughs>